Hi there, welcome to a DNA lecture video number three. This lecture video, we're going to focus on what's called DNA replication. And fancy word replication just means to copy, DNA copying itself. Um, in an earlier unit, we may have discussed um, a cell cycle. Well, that's like the life of a cell. And a cell goes through a life cycle, all right? In its life cycle, it goes through a part called G1 where it's growing and getting ready to divide. The S portion of the cell cycle is called synthesis. That's where DNA copies itself. So DNA replication happens in this S part of the cell cycle where DNA is copying itself. After it copies itself, it grows a little more. G2 gets ready for division. And M, mitosis and cytokinesis, this is a cell dividing and producing a genetic copy or a duplicate of itself. And before it can make this copy of itself back here in the S, it had to make a copy of its DNA so that these resulting cells each have the exact same coding, the exact same 46 chromosomes. Otherwise, errors could take place and those errors could lead, which are called mutations, changes in the DNA, could lead to problems potentially, okay? So replication is when DNA copies itself. It's a really big deal to understand it because when we talk about DNA changing or mutating, random changes in DNA mutations, when we talk about that, it generally happens during replication when DNA is getting copied, all right? Something goes wrong and the wrong letter gets placed, A, C, S, T, G, something gets flip-flopped or reversed, or changed, or removed, or deleted, or added, or copied, and boom, now we have a change in our DNA, which could be potentially a problem, okay? Now, DNA, all right, this says here, DNA is a template. Well, what DNA could serve as a template. What does that mean? Well, you take DNA, it has two sides, and you break the hydrogen bonds, and now you have two strands, or you have two, whoops, or you have two templates to produce new DNA from. So DNA is a copy. DNA is made from a previous copy of one of the strands. So each strand is then duplicated using complementary base pairing rules. And now you have two new strands that are identical to the first strand. All right. This process is controlled by proteins. Enzymes control this entire process. Inside of eukaryotes, you and me, this happens in our nucleus. Why? That's where our DNA is found. Bacteria, they do not have a nucleus. So this process takes place inside of their cytoplasm. Okay, let's begin. Steps. Now, the picture I have here has a lot of detail on it. More detail than is in the explanation, but I like it, so I left it that way. Okay, my number one doesn't always, my numbers here, there's one, two, three, four, five, and you'll notice you do not have one, two, three, four, five in your notes. There's more detail here than is in your notes. So this picture will help you um, get a further understanding of it. I have also included um, a link in my lecture to a three-dimensional video of it. You need to watch both videos to really have an understanding of DNA replication. You need to watch this video I'm producing right now, and you need to watch the 3D video, which is another video. You need to watch both videos to really understand DNA replication. <clears throat> Let's begin. According to your book, step one, helicase. That's a fancy name. When you see ASC at the end, that's an enzyme. Helicase is an enzyme. What does it do? Well, helicase is an enzyme that actually breaks the hydrogen bonds that we're holding these DNA together. So this strand up here and a strand down here, okay? These strands are being held together by hydrogen bonds. What does helicase do? It breaks those hydrogen bonds, creating a fork. So this is called the replication fork. So the replication fork is made by helicase. It breaks apart the hydrogen bonds that we're holding together, the two strands of DNA, and this replication fork is now created. That's the first step of replication. Okay. Your book simplified it more than my picture. The number two here is not the number two here. Okay. So your book simplified it. Let me explain the number two here. Number two here, this one in the picture says single strand binding proteins stabilize the unwound parental DNA. Well, these hydrogen bonds, they want to go right back together. They're kind of like magnets. Okay. And you know how magnets, if they're the right distance apart, they want to stick together. So Number two in my picture here is showing you these, these proteins that are 
stabilizing it and keeping it from reattaching to itself, preventing replication, okay? So that's what this number two is here, all right? The number three here just starts describing this, the strands of DNA and what they're called, okay? So we're going to explain all these in one second, all right? So here we go. DNA polymerase, all right, according to your book. This is your book simplified. it. DNA polymerase is an enzyme. And what does this enzyme do? It is an enzyme that attaches. It's right here in the picture. What it is is start at the beginning and it moved along those exposed bases. And as it moves along, DNA polymerase adds complementary nucleotides. What does that mean? Well, if there was an A here, DNA polymerase added a T. If there was a T here, it added an A. If there was a C, it added a G. If there was a G, it added a C. It moved along and kept adding um, nucleotides according to the base pairing rules. That's what DNA polymerase does. So the job of DNA polymerase in this case is to create the complementary strand of DNA as it moves along. Okay. What happens? Hydrogen bonds form and it starts creating that second strand right there. All right. So more detail. Let's go in the detail here. Well, what happens at the replication fork? That's what this next title is. Well, DNA, all right, it's anti-parallel. Let's go back to a previous lecture where I told you there's a five and a three on one strand, and then the other strand is opposite. So if that's the five side, this is the three, and we go to the five here. Well, I mentioned to you in an earlier lecture that DNA is constructed in the five to three direction. So this top one here, is constructed continuously. It just keeps getting made in the five to three direction. So as this fork opens, it exposes more DNA and it just, this DNA polymerase just keeps moving along and adding DNA to it, okay? So it keeps continuously producing it. The one that's produced in a continuous fashion is called the leading strand of DNA, okay? So the leading strand of DNA is produced in a continuous fashion in the five to three direction towards the fork, all right? There's a problem. There's another strand, all right? This one here, you'll notice, the bottom strand here, they're made in pieces, okay? This one here is called the lagging strand. So we have the leading strand made continuously. We have the lagging strand made in pieces. Well, why is it made in pieces? Well, because when you are building in the five to three prime direction, Okay, five to three, that's the only direction you can build in. In this case, the five to three prime direction on this strand is going in the other direction, away from the fork. Okay, so the lagging strand is built away from the fork. Because it's build, built away from the fork, the fork keeps exposing the five on the bottom. This bottom, the lagging strand, the five is getting exposed. And DNA can only be built from the five to the three. So this lagging strand is built away from the fork. Because it's built away from the fork, each section has to be built in chunks and then reconnected later. It's kind of complicated. So what does that mean? So as the replication fork opens up, DNA polymerase once again will attach itself and then start producing in the five to three prime direction. So it moves away from the fork. The problem is the fork keeps opening, exposing more DNA. So then DNA polymerase has to reattach and build away from the fork. As more fork, as the fork opens more, DNA polymerase attaches and moves away from the fork. Because of this, because it's being built away from the replication fork, it will build chunks of DNA in pieces called Okazagi fragments. So DNA can only be produced from the five towards the three. And because of that, there's always going to be one side, a leading strand towards the fork that, be, that is built continuously. The one away from the fork is built in pieces because it's going, um, because the five to three is flip-flopped on the bottom strand. And as the strand opens up, as the fork keeps opening up, you're going to have, DNA polymerase is going to have to reattach and build that section. And at the end, an enzyme called DNA ligase, DNA ligase at the end attaches all the pieces together, all right? How does DNA polymerase know where to attach? Um, there's a primer. It's a beginning point is added. And an RNA primer is added. And that's how DNA polymerase knows where to attach 
and build a piece. So what will happen as this fork opens up, a primer will get laid down. RNA polymer, DNA polymerase, excuse me, will then build from that primer to the next primer. So it builds from primer to primer, and at the end, DNA ligase will remove, these primers will fall off, and DNA ligase will fill them in with DNA nucleotides. I know it's complicated. Why are they RNA primers? I don't know. That's just how they happen to work. I don't know if we can explain to you the why it works. It just happens to work that way. So a quick review of this, because this is the detail, and this is the part that students struggle with. DNA is built in one direction continuously towards the fork, and it's built from five to three towards the fork, okay? That is the leading strand. The other strand is built in pieces. Why? Because it is being built away in the direction away from the fork. So as the fork opens, it exposes new DNA, and, RNA, and DNA polymerase has to then attach to an area and build away from the fork. How does DNA polymerase know where to attach? There's an RNA primer that is laid down. These are RNA nucleotides. And that allows DNA polymerase to know where to attach and know where to build. Because one strand, like this bottom strand, the, the lagging strand is built away from the fork. It is built in pieces that are then glued together by an enzyme called DNA ligase. It attaches all the pieces together and the RNA primers fall off and DNA nucleotides are attached. Okay, so the leading, leading strand towards the fork continuously. The lagging strand away from the fork in pieces of DNA. And those pieces are called Okazagi fragments. Bacteria or prokaryotic replication? Well, it's different than ours. They have circular DNA. We do not. They only have one chromosome. We have 46 chromosomes. So bacterial DNA, it's simpler than ours because with much less DNA to copy, um, circular DNA is different than linear DNA and so on and so forth. So how does it work? A point of origin or an origin point occurs. What does that mean? That is where the replication fork starts to form. What happens? A replication fork starts to open up here and your next picture shows you that you have a replication fork going in both directions. All right, so you have DNA being replicated in one direction, you have it being replicated in the other direction. Eventually it keeps peeling off, it keeps peeling off and it keeps peeling away and eventually it separates and you get a termination of replication takes place and then you have two new chromosomes. And this Then the prokaryote or the bacteria has now copied its one chromosome and made a copy of itself, of its chromosome. They can split and then make another copy. The bacteria can produce another bacteria that now has all of its correct DNA. So prokaryotic DNA replication begins in one place, two forks in each direction peel off, and you end up with two new chromosomes. One of these chromosomes will be in each new resulting bacteria cell. Bacteria do not have a nucleus. It happens in the cytoplasm. You and me, we are eukaryotes. We have a nucleus. So replication happens in our nucleus. That's where DNA is found. Because we have so many chromosomes, we have 46 of them. We're not like bacteria. They have one. DNA replication, if, if we only had one origin point, it would take way too long to replicate our DNA. Okay, it would become a problem. So humans or organisms, unlike bacteria, any, uh, any organisms that are eukaryotes, plants, you name it, multiple chromosomes, there's many points of origin that occur. Many replication forks start peeling off in many directions. Eventually, they all meet together, and you end up having two new DNA molecules, okay? The replication begins at many points because it would take too long if it did not occur that way, all right? Eventually, these forks meet those forks, and the DNA will eventually be completed, okay? So re eukaryotic replication, more points of origin because there's more DNA to copy in comparison to bacteria or prokaryotes. Well, when DNA is copying itself, errors can occur, all right? Um, mutations are changes in DNA, and we learned those in a previous chapter. Random changes in DNA. Well, when do these changes occur? Well, some things, uh, your DNA can be exposed to different things. And the things that your DNA is exposed to, for example, can be exposed to radiation. Your DNA can change. And then when DNA copies itself, the DNA is then in turn different. So now you've had mutated or changed DNA. DNA polymerase is the enzyme that lays down the DNA nucleotides when DNA is replicated. Well, DNA polymerase, there's different kinds. 
also is the, the proofreader or the, the DNA that checks to make sure things didn't go wrong. So after DNA replication takes place, DNA polymerase comes along. That's this green thing in the picture. And it notices, wait a minute, something's not right here. Something's not right here. And DNA polymerase then can repair changes in our DNA. If the repairs do not take place, then the new DNA that we will produce as a result of it will have been mutated and changed. So errors that escape repair are what lead to these mutations. All right. Mutations. Some of them have no effect. And we'll learn how that occurs by the end of the unit. Some of them have negative effects. Some of them can kill an organism. Some of them can have positive effects. Let me explain to you how it can be a negative effect. I mentioned to you earlier that DNA is the code for making proteins. You can make a protein that is maybe better. That could be a positive effect. Or you could have a protein that used to be just fine, work great, and now your mutation makes that protein not function anymore. That could lead to death or problems in an organism. So mutations, I wouldn't say they're usually positive. I would say a lot of them in a lot of cases don't have any effect on us. So our DNA mutates naturally. The person, you, the, the DNA you were born with is different in your body today. It has changed as a result of um, DNA's uh, ability to mutate naturally on its own. DNA is just going to mutate. It's, there's going to be slight differences and changes over time. The goal is to not get mutations that can lead to diseases like cancer. All right. So a mutation that changes some things, it could lead to cancer and that could lead to a lot of problems. All right. What leads to mutations? And I have a picture of them here. Oh, I have a picture on another page I'll show you in a second. Smoking, chemicals, radiation, certain types of uh, biological agents can lead to mutation. I'll explain to you like a virus, for example, can cause mutation and things of that sort. Okay. So cancer is linked to DNA replication because if, if cells do not get, if you do not catch cells that have been damaged and then you, those cells start multiplying themselves. Well, now you have defective DNA potentially in these new cells. And then that in a sense can lead to cancer. So this picture here kind of shows you what happens. So let's think about it. This is an area of DNA and this is a gene and you have a tumor. You have genes called tumor suppressor genes. They suppress tumors. Okay. Tumors are, are cells that grow out of control. They just keep dividing when they're not supposed to. So we have Tumor suppressor genes, which means we have genes in our body that prevent things from becoming tumors, from growing uncontrollably. So this is the code for producing a protein that suppresses things from growing out of control. Okay, so you have an enzyme or a protein that prevents cell division from going out of control. All right, tumor suppressor genes. Well, if you have a change or a mutation in your DNA, in your tumor suppressor gene, and this is what this is showing you, mutated tumor suppressor. There's a change in the DNA in that gene. Well, that change now created a defective protein. Okay. So you now cannot suppress tumors in that case or in that part of the body. So now when cells divide in that area, they control their, the control is gone because the gene that produced the protein is defective. So the protein is now defective. So now these cells divide uncontrollably. A tumor has now formed. And this they keep growing and they keep growing. And what do tumors do? They suffocate other parts of our bodies. They steal the nutrition from other areas of our bodies. They grow uncontrollably. All right? So that's this whole process, what's taking place here. All right? So if mutations, if mutations allow organisms to survive and reproduce, those are good mutations. Okay. And then if they get passed on, those are good things. So this first statement is saying good things. Some mutations are good. They're, they're what has allowed evolution to take place. And then we've called those adaptations over time because they've given organisms an ability to heal. Okay. So you can have mutations that can make a protein function better. All right. But can't, but cancer is when you have a mutation that causes a protein to not function correctly anymore. All right. So when that one, and it's specifically with cancer, the proteins that we are talking about are cell cycle proteins, proteins that control when and how cells will divide. If you mess with those proteins, 
that's when cancer shows up, okay? These are all the things that can lead to cancer. Radiation, different kinds of radiation, x -ray, excessive x-rays, not good, ultraviolet, chemicals in the form of smoke, nitrates are preservatives in hot dogs and, and lunch meat. Those are linked to cancer. When you burn something, like the actual burning, when you burn meat, for example, the, the chemicals that are produced during the burning process, the charred meat, and we all like the way it tastes. I like the way it tastes. Adds flavor to your meat. When you char the edges of the meat, that those chemicals are linked to cancer. Certain chemicals we use, like acne, benzoyl peroxide, people use it as an as a acne facial wash, linked to cancer. We have certain biological infectious agents. There's a virus called the HPV virus that can lead to cervical cancer. There's a bacteria called H. pylori or Helobacter pylori, which can lead to stomach cancer or ulcers and things of that nature. So these are all um, mutation causers slash cancer causers. Right? We will stop right there.